Hallelujah. I greet you all in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. It's such a privilege to join you at the EYO Mega Camp 2020. Praise the Lord. I love the team. It's God serious. I thank God for the previous speakers. I saw Apostle Jeff Gimmes and others. I don't remember all the names, but I thank God for what He has spoken through all of them in this camp. And I trust that you have been blessed uh, coming from different parts of Africa. Everywhere I go, everybody says it's Africa's time. And I'm glad that wherever you find yourself, you'll be activated, you'll be mobilized, you'll be strengthened, you'll be stirred up after this camp, that your life will not be the same again. I thank the International Director, Mr. Kwesi Otin Yeboah, and his uh, beautiful, wonderful wife, Mrs. Abigail Otin Yeboah, and all the leaders at two, Manfo Atuakwa, and everyone, Kate, Eleonora, God bless you all for the good work you're doing. Keep pressing on. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for EYO. Thank you for what you're doing. Thank you for Mega Camp. Speak, Lord. Uh, I'm a servant. I surrender to you that you speak and let your people hear. And I pray that we will not just be hearers, but each one of us will be doers. I pray this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The topic I'm going to speak on today, I love it. Yes. So is God serious about reaching the whole world? If you know me, you know that's my passion. The whole world. It says it takes the whole church to take the whole gospel to the whole world. That's the Lausanne Covenant. And many people have tweaked it in different ways. But it takes the whole church to take the whole gospel to the whole world. So today I'm going to speak on the topic, is God serious about reaching the whole world? You know the answer. <laughs> God is serious, is we who are not serious. Many believers are not saying, we're going to dissect the word of God, and we're going to go into the word of God, and I'll prove to you from his word that God is serious. The hymn writer wrote a hymn called, Hark the voice of Jesus calling, who will go and work today, fields are white and harvest waiting, who will bear the ships away. Loud and long the master calls, rich reward he offers free. Who will answer gladly saying, here I am, send me, send me. Like Isaiah, I pray that after this camp, not some of you, but all of you. These days I was preaching at the church recently and I said, God, I want 100%. I'm praying for, that was a large church. I'm praying that everybody in the church will be activated for the Great Commission, for the end time harvest. You know what Jesus said, our master said, the harvest is plenty, but the workers are few. So Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plenty, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. That's Matthew 9, 35 to 38. We are part of a 938 movement, and we set our watches and our alarms to 938. Either 938 uh, a.m. or p.m., and you pray for more harvesters. And I pray that you pray, and you might be the answer to your own prayer. But Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease. That's one evidence I want to give you, that God is serious. Jesus is God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. So God had one son. He made him a missionary. God, the Father himself, is said to be the, the, the first missionary. When Adam sinned in the Garden of Eden in Genesis chapter 3, God came in the cool of the day and said, Adam, where are you? Adam, where are you? An interesting story is told of uh, a missionary who came to Ghana, James Marquion, many years ago, started the Church of Pentecost, and he was having a, a crusade, and, and he was preaching from that verse. Adam, where are you? There was a young man called Adam who was minding his own business, going to drink, he's just going on his way, and he heard his name. And he heard, Adam, where are you? He says, I am here. He came and he gave his life to Christ. Very interesting. That's the power of God. 
That's the power of the Holy Spirit to bring conviction. But God came down to look for man and God has still been looking for man. I am here today speaking to you because God looked for me. I got saved in my room. One day I'll share my testimony. God looked out for me and I got saved. He saved me. God is looking for man. So God is a missionary father. Jesus is a missionary Lord and the Holy Spirit is a missionary spirit. So today I want to share with you the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, they are all missionary. Henry Martin said, the, 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 the spirit of Christ is the spirit of missions. The closer you get to him, the more missionary you become. There's no way you can be close to the Holy Spirit and not be mission-minded and not be passionate about the Great Commission. Something is wrong. So something is wrong with majority of the church. Something is wrong with many churches. Something is wrong. How do I know God is serious about reaching the whole world? How do I know? One, there are only two answers. One, through his word. Two, through his actions. <laughs> they say, action speaks louder than words. Action speaks louder than words. Since the Garden of Eden, Genesis 3, God has been looking for man here to reconcile. And there he prophesied that the, the, the day will come, the woman will strike the heel of the serpent. Through his word. And through his actions. Jesus, when he came down, he went to every town. He went in Jerusalem and, and Bethlehem. He went round where he was based. Every town and every village. Preaching the good news. I know through his word and through his actions. I have good news for you. The whole Bible is a missionary book. My brothers, my sisters. The whole Bible is a missionary book. A missionary called Ninaganta says, if you take missions out of the Bible, you won't have anything left but the covers. I'm going to share the Great Commission scriptures with you in a, in a jiffy. But before uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, before the Gospels were written in the New Testament, God has already been a missionary God. Right from Genesis 1 to Revelation 21, the whole Bible is filled with missionary scriptures. Arthur Glaser, who was a professor at Fuller's Theological Seminary, he says, the day the church will understand the theology of missions, the biblical basis of missions, then the church will embrace missions. He wrote a big book on theology of missions. He wrote a big book, and as I studied the book, I felt that the church should be taught this from the Word of God. The Word of God is the basis. God's Word is His bond. Everything is, heaven and earth shall pass away, but the Word of God will not pass away. So nothing has changed. A couple of years ago, a, a certain leader came from a certain country to Ghana, and he, he tried to say, the Great Commission ah, has changed. God didn't intend for us to go to the nations. God didn't intend for the missionaries to come to Africa. It was a mistake. They should have come from Europe and, 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 and other places. The Basel mission and the Bremen mission and others who came with their clothes in, 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 in coffins and, 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 and they, they died. You know, the Presbyterian Church celebrated the anniversary something like 192 years or so just this week. And it's amazing telling the story how they came and the first missionaries, they died and another group came. They brought a doctor to check out the missionaries was dying. The doctor himself was dead. He died and they died young, but they kept coming. And something happened. It's an interesting story. The chief, Nana Dudankwa uh, of a coupon says, no, show us somebody like us. Show us a black man who can read the white man's book. He's talking about Bible. Show us somebody who is like us. Who, and then they, they went back. And just read, they went back and they recruited Jamaicans who had been discipled by the Moravians. You know the story of the Moravians. I'm going to. They were ready to sell themselves as slaves. They were ready to go into a slave plantation. And they made disciples among the slaves. Who will go? And they recruited. These are 34 missionaries or so, Jamaicans, black like us, black like me and you. And they came and they broke through. The Basel mission has failed, but when they brought the black missionaries, they, they pressed through. I tell you, God is serious about reaching the world. <laughs> the gospel is not only people think, oh, the missionary work is for white people, and they say, only missionaries I know are white people. But even in the history of missions in Ghana, God used black people in the West Indies, the Caribbeans, to reach Ghana. And they broke through. 
And the rest, as they say, is history. Ghana now is 71.2% Christian from zero. <laughs> they spent many years with not a convert. But when the black people came, they broke through. I tell you, the whole Bible is a missionary book. There was a group called the Celtics. They opened Genesis chapter 12. And God says to Abraham, leave your father's house to a land where I'll show you. That was enough to call them to missions. It was Genesis 12, not Matthew 28, 18. It was Genesis 12 that God used to call the Celtics. And they felt a missionary call. They said, we're going to go to the ends of the earth. And there were no planes. There were ships. And they would sit in a ship. They would board a ship and sail. And when they get to any coast, they will find out, Holy Spirit, is this where I'm supposed to, to alight? Is this where I'm supposed to disembark? And if they didn't sense the Holy Spirit saying yes, then they will stay on the ship and go to the next coast. And when they feel it was a place, they one way ticket and there was no turning back. Genesis 12. God used it to send. We had a missions conference just recently last month, and one of the speakers, Dr. Yopebi, was talking about how he was reading Genesis chapter 12. <laughs> and then he got a revelation that God was taking to the nations. He says he told his wife, next year by this time we will not be here in Ghana because God is sending us to the nations. And as we speak, he's in the nations and based in Canada, we are reaching the nations. God uses Genesis 12. God uses Exodus. There's missions everywhere in the Bible. There is a missionary statesman called William Oforiata, the late William Oforiata. If you are not Ghanaian, you might not know him so much. But he's among the founding fathers of Ghana. We call them the Big Six with Kwame Nkrumah. You all know Kwame Nkrumah. He was one of them, the Big Six, founding father of Ghana. And he was a political activist. So he went to prison, I think, about five times. He was a prison graduate because of political uh, expediency. And he would not keep quiet. He would stand for what was right and for justice. So he was put in prison by the political authorities. And the story is that the wife baked a nice slice of cake. The wife brought him some slice of cake and the Bible. And the prison officers would not allow the cake in. They didn't allow food from outside. But they allowed the Bible. He was a lawyer and a politician. He was a statesman. So he had nothing in the prison to read except the Bible. He read the Bible from cover, Genesis to Revelation. <sighs> Remember Nina, Nina Ganta said, if you take missions out of the Bible, you won't have anything left by the covers. The, the statesman, Paul Willie, read the Bible and he got saved as a result. And you know what happened to he got activated for missions. <laughs> if, you are, if people are reading the Bible, they don't get activated for missions. I wonder what they are reading. We, we know what we do. We pick and choose. I'm the head and not the tail. I, my Lord shall provide all my needs according to... That's the scriptures Christians like. They pick and choose. But they don't read the whole counsel of God. If you read the whole counsel of God, you will be activated. Nobody will tell you, Kai, wake up and be part of the Great Commission. Get up and go. Pray, give, go. Nobody's going to tell you. Paul when he was in a prison and as he read the Bible... The same Bible you are reading, and now I'm reading. He was activated. When he was released, he came out, he was saying, Where are the black missionaries? Why are there only white missionaries? But God didn't call only white people. Why? He read through the Bible that we are all called. And that's going to be the premise of my message. We are all called. We are all saints. He found like-minded people, and they had a retreat. It's interesting. As you... Easter house party, they had a retreat, and the rest, they say, is history. But God used them to found the first indigenous Ghanaian mission agency called Christian Archery Fellowship. And they began to send missionaries. And so many things he did, uh, there was no time to go into it, how God used him to, to spark the new life for all. He, he re re resigned from his legal practice and became director of the mission agency. He did so many amazing things. But it was the Bible <laughs> that he got called. It was the Bible that when you open, he found out that God is serious about reaching the world. Uncle Ross Campbell tells me he went, they called the pastors to get the heads of the denomination and they asked the simple question Is the Great Commission for us today? This was in the 70s. Nobody was preaching the gospel. They asked the church leaders of that day Is the gospel the same? Is the Great Commission for us today? Or it was only for Peter and Paul and James and John. 
And they went through the word of God. And as they had their retreat, and they said, Yes, it is for us. Is God serious about reaching the nation still? Or has he changed his mind? Has he gone leave? The last time I checked, God doesn't sleep nor slumber. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Your guess is good as mine. The answer is a resounding yes. It's a big yes. 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 You can say with me wherever you are. It might be in Kenya or Malawi or Zambia, but you're going to say where you are. Yes. God is serious about reaching the whole world with the gospel. Hebrews 9.27 says, And just as each person is destined to die once, and after that comes judgment. Everybody is destined to die once after that judgment. If your name is not found in the book of life. That's why God is serious about reaching the nations. In Acts 17, verse 30 to 31, it says, Paul was speaking to, to these people and said, In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. In the past, he overlooked the ignorance. He allowed people to worship idols and to do certain things because there's a time for everything. But now he commands all people. God commands all people everywhere to repent. How would they know? Romans 10 says, how would they hear? How would they believe unless there's a preacher? How would they hear unless there's a preacher? How beautiful are the feet of those who bring goodness. I pray that you have beautiful feet. The beautiful feet is not buy a nice shoe or buy wear a Nike canvas, but it's when you go preaching the gospel. The old gospel. I miss the whole gospel. For God has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. That man is called Jesus Christ. That was Paul. In 2 Peter 3 verse 9, Peter wrote, he says, The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Today, I want to remind you that God is slow in keeping. It's not that he's slow, but he doesn't want people to perish. We are going to go through the statistics. Over three billion. If Jesus comes tonight, do you know how many people? Close to half of the world will go to hell. It is very scary. It is not a joke. You might have heard this maybe a thousand times or two thousand times. But I want you to hear it with a fresh pair of ears. Anytime I'm speaking, anytime I'm reading, anytime I'm, 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 I'm doing a presentation, my heart is stirred. Even as I'm sharing and preparing this presentation, my heart is stirred up. I wish I'll hear five times, six times messages on the Great Commission because we easily get distracted. We easily get, what do you call it, confused. We easily forget about the main thing and we stop making the main thing the main thing. Believers. It's so easy. Pastors, even missionaries can get distracted. I've seen mission agencies, missionaries. I can tell you stories about missionaries around the world who got distracted. The devil is a liar. Missionaries who no longer serve God and they are tired. The devil is after the harvest. The harvest, the harvest force is very small, but he's going after them. So the majority of the church is just slacking and sleeping and, and snoring. But it's time to wake up. It's time to wake up. God is giving us time. He is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand. He is patient, not wanting anyone to perish. He is giving us time. So your father can be saved, your mother can be saved, your brothers can be saved, your cousins can be saved, but it's not just your family. That man in Brungugu Yoyo, that man in Saudi Arabia, that man in China, that man in, in Yemen, that man in Niger, that man in Chad, how were they here? They got to be saved. That man in Egypt, that man in, in Sudan, that man in that remote village in Burkina Faso, up north, with the Niger border, 
How would they hear? How would the full are they hear? How would the, 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 the Arabs here and the Hausa people? Who will go? Who will go? Sometimes I feel we should, we should preach this gospel, this great commission thing, like five times a day. I need it. We need it. Don't get things, oh, I know all these things. No, we don't know it. If we know it, we will have saved the world by now. We will have taken the nations. Only few people know it. Only few people are blind. I said, action speaks louder than words. God has proved by action. He is serious about reaching the world. He called me. I was minding my own business. I had plans. <laughs> I won't even go into it. I had my plans. I was, I was 25 years old, minding my own business. How, what I'm going to do with my life and the countries I want to travel to. I had my plans set up. God called me out. He said, will you go to Botswana? He's still calling. <laughs> Today he's going to call somebody. <laughs> and if you hear his voice, don't harden your heart. He's still calling people and sending them to the nations. One of our board members told me he went to his pastor because the church says this is our year of discipleship. He was so excited. Wow, our church has the team. One of the years was their year of discipleship. He was so excited. So he went to the pastor. He said, Pastor, what's our budget? What's the budget for discipleship? He said, I'm so excited. Wow, God is at work. And the pastor said, which budget? There was no budget. It's just rhetoric. It's just words. We whitewash the wall, but no action. We pay glory tribute. We pay lip service. Many churches, many pastors pay lip service to the Great Commission. That's why the work is not done. That's why the work is not done. That's why the majority of the work of the world is still unrich. Because we pay lip service. Many of us pay lip service. Many of us have been in EYO. You have been in EYO by paying lip service. But the time for action is now. No more lip service. It's time for action. There's a time for everything. You gotta do more. <laughs> if you have been, uh, if you have been walking, you can run. If you have been running, you can, you can, you can fly. If you have been flying, everybody gonna go to the next level. I'm going to the next level. 2021, we're gonna go to the next level. The thing about the Great Commission is that it's only a minority and we are passionate to see, see God activate more people. It's only a remnant. And if the remnants get tired, <laughs> If the remnants get weary, then who is going to do the job? I was telling a certain church, I was preaching, you know, certain pastors become motivational speakers. I say, anybody can be a motivational speaker, but only pastors can preach the gospel. Churches we do, with churches and mission agents we do, in our organization we do social action, water and, 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 and education. We do a lot and it's part of the Great Commission, so we call it social action. If the people don't have water you, and you try, they don't have schools, then the best schools were built by missionaries, hospitals, so it's part of the work. But government does that. That's government's main job. NGOs do that. International organizations do that. Companies do that. They have what they call corporate uh, what? So, uh, social responsibility or some CSR. They have it. And then they, they do that. So many people can build hospitals. They can build wells. They can do that. But they will not preach the gospel. The government will not preach the gospel. Uh, Absa Bank or MTN will not preach the gospel. The only people assigned who have the mandate to preach the gospel is the church. Nobody else is going to preach the gospel. So if we live the gospel, then who is going to preach? I hope you're getting me. So God is not slow, but God is waiting, giving us time. 2020. We didn't think we'll get to 2020. Even the year 2000 was coming with a million bucks. Those of you who are old enough, you remember the Y2K, a million bucks, and people say it's going to be the end of the year, uh, the end of the world, and, 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 and there was an AD 2000 movement. And I was in missionary school in 1997, and I, it was, they were trying, they said, we've got to finish the work by 2000. There will be no rich people group. And I was in missionary school, young, passionate, and I was thinking, oh, won't we have the opportunity to also reach some of the rich people groups before they got finished? So I was in a hurry to get out of missionary school to reach the rich. So I also, like Paul, so I also went where the gospel has not been preached because they got to be rich. Somebody has to have a sense of agency. Somebody's going to run with the gospel. And that was 2000 today. It's 2020 coming to an end. I'm going to show you there are about 7,000 rich people groups. 
What they thought they could finish in, seven, in the year 2000. Now there's more. 7,400. There's more. Some are up to 50 million people with not one single Christian. It's worse. There's still more work. The harvest is plenty and it gets plenty. They say every day one person dies, every day two children are born. Every day. The statistics say one person dies, two people are born. So those who are born are more than. That's why the world population keeps going up. I might as well give you some statistics. People groups in the world are 17,442. The rich people groups are 7,407. 7,000, wow. The rich percentage is 42.5%. The population of the world now is 7.75. It's almost getting to 8 million. 7.75 million. This is current statistics from Joshua Project. Joshua Project, we're in some conference calls with them. They give us the latest statistics. Population of the rich is 3.23 billion. 3.23 billion people. That's 41.6% of the world. Getting to half of the world has no head. Something should be. Stare in your heart. I'm in full-time missions, but when I see this, it stares in my heart. God, have mercy on me. Forgive me my sins. What am I not doing right? We can't just take it easy. We can't just rest on our hours. We can't say, oh, I've done my part. In Ghana and most parts of Africa, we, we think missions is seasonal. So maybe you are in your university, you go with Gafes, you go with UI, you go with Tin Aloud, you go with... Uh, Gamsu, you go with uh, Aposa, you go on short term missions. It's very normal to go on short term missions when you're on the university campus. And I met, I meet so many people when I try to activate. Say, oh, yeah, missions, I hear that we have been involved in missions when we're in school. Missions is not seasonal, it's a lifestyle, it's a lifetime. Missions is a lifetime. Who oh, go? You don't graduate. It's not like university, you graduate from missions. You know, you never graduate from missions. It's a lifetime to your last breath. <laughs> when 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 Agabus came and took Paul's belt and tied his hands, he says, That says the Lord, this is what the Jews are going to do to the owner of this belt. It's, I see only prisons and torture and persecution and trouble. And they all say, Don't go, please don't go, don't go. And Paul said, You guys. Why are you making me cry? I'm not ready just to suffer and go to prison, but I'm ready to die for Jesus. And he died for Jesus. He died. He said, I finished the fight. I finished the race. I fought a good fight. Now it's his tough for me, the crown of righteousness. He prayed till they cut off his head. He prayed to the last age. I went to a funeral last month. My friend, he, he was diabetic. He had to do dialysis every week. He had gone blind. But he had a passion for the gospel. <laughs> May his soul rest in peace, Brother Matthew Dawson. And I, the story is at his funeral. Even whilst he was blind and he was sick, and when they, they take a taxi or an Uber and he's going to hospital, he will win a soul for Christ. He, he will preach to the taxi driver. He will preach to the Uber driver. When he gets to hospital, he will preach to the doctors. He will preach to the nurses. He will preach to the lab technician. The guy is putting the pins and the dialysis and the drip and he's sharing the gospel. To his last breath, we buried him last month, but he's in a better place. He preached to his last breath. He didn't get, he didn't get, he didn't get pathetic. He didn't have a pity party. Where is God? He knew that there's a place called heaven. Many Christians don't know there's a place called heaven. They think heaven is a joke and hell is a joke. But when you know heaven is real, your lifestyle will be different. He preached till he entered heaven. I believe he will hear the master say, Well done. <laughs> well done. Good and faithful servant. Now enter your master's, master's rest. God is serious. My brothers, my sisters, my fathers, my mothers, my sons, my daughters. God is serious. That's his number one business. That's his number one passion. That's his number one heart. You know John 3, 16. He so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That shows he's serious. He gave his son. He has only one son. He gave him his son. That's to prove to you how serious he is. He gave his son. 
If you've ever watched the peace child, when, when the two tribes, Don Richie and his wife, they went and, and served among a tribe in Iranjaya, very remote, and they would fight, and then treachery was, was the order of the day, if you can deceive your friend, and then and, and get them killed, and they eat, they were cannibals, they eat human flesh, and then the tribes would fight, and then they fought for days, for weeks, for months, and then he says, if they don't stop fighting, they are going to leave. But because the wife was a nurse and he had uh, some more modern tools, they didn't want them to leave. So they said they will stop fighting. And the story in the peace child, true story, is very interesting. And the way they make peace, he was finding what they call a, a redemptive analogy to reach out to them because he preached what was called the wrong gospel. He told them Judas betrayed Jesus and they believe in treachery. So they, they said they will follow Judas. So he was looking for a point of contact, a redemptive analogy. And then when they decided to make peace, the chief gave his son <laughs> to show that he's serious about peace. When you are serious, action speaks louder than words. God gave his only son. When it says once he gave his son, that means there's peace because his son will go to the other tribe. And when you attack, then you could kill his son. So there will be no war and there will be peace till that generation passes away. They are serious. Many people are, God is serious, but we are not serious. This year has been coronavirus, no international missions. Have you preached the gospel? How many disciples have been made? How much have you given to missions this year? What have you done for the cause of the Great Commission this year? Let me ask you. Is international missions adventure? Is that only time you preach? Or what do you do? What do you do with your life? What have you done with 2020? Did you just mourn about coronavirus? Or was it an, an avenue, an opportunity to share the gospel even online? Everybody is online, and you can make disciples online. How serious are you with the Great Commission? My brothers and sisters, I say God is serious. Let me take you to the Great Commission. I can take you Genesis, uh, Exodus, and go Leviticus, but there will be no time. <laughs> Let me just narrow down to the Great Commission and see the principle of Great Commission, Matthew 28, 18 to 20. Therefore, it says, oh, authority in heaven has been given to me. I give you that authority. Wow. <laughs> Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, not just Dansoman, not just Kwaswa, of all nations. That is how serious God is about the Great Commission, about reaching the whole world. That's the principle of the Great Commission is make disciples. And the scale of the Great Commission is Mark 16, 15 to 18. It says, oh, go into the world and preach the gospel to every creature, every creature, everybody. <laughs> Don't spare anybody. Preach. Young, old, professor, president, billionaire, poor man, market woman, uh, lawyer, doctor. Preach to anybody. Nurse, teacher, student. Preach to anybody. He said, go into the world and preach the gospel to everybody. Many times we are selective. If you go and see some people, the way they are dressed with their beard, you know where they come from, their faith, then you skip them. A story is told in, in Kolebu, a, a chaplain, a man goes to pray, pray for people at the Kolebu hospital, teaching hospital. And then he goes from bed to bed. And there was this man who was a, a fetish priest wearing his white attire, you know how they dress, and he would skip him. And he, he would preach the gospel to the rest. Is that not what we do? Scared of some people. May God bind fear out of each one of us in the name of Jesus. So long story short, about after three days, when he skipped this man who was a woman, the man called him and said, Pastor, I don't know why you pray for everybody and you skip me. I, I don't know why you preach the gospel, you preach to everybody, but you leave me. I've been listening to you and I've come to the conclusion that Jesus is Lord. I want to give my life to him. And he said he knew that he was not going to get out of the hospital and when he died, he wanted a Christian burial. And he says the following day, the pastor should come, he was going to call his whole family and tell them he wanted a Christian burial. And he asked the pastor to lead him to Christ. And the man gloriously got saved. <laughs> and the following day, he called his children. He told the children, he's now a child of God. And he's following Jesus Christ. And he wants a Christian burial. And the pastor should bury him. A big soul would have been lost and gone to hell because he was selected. He said, preach the gospel to all creatures. Everybody. Where? In the whole world. Number three, the message of the Great Commission can be found in Luke 24, 47. It says, repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name, starting from Jerusalem. 
What's the message of the Great Commission? Repentance. The first word of the gospel is repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. We can't preach the gospel without repentance. The church is full of people who are not repented, who are not truly saved. In most countries in Africa, Ghana, Zambia, Kenya, many I can keep mentioning, full of nominal Christians. Nominalism is our biggest challenge. Why is the gospel not permitting the nations? Why is there no great commission action? Nominalism. The church is full of nominal people who are not born again. I preach the gospel to people in Ghana, 71.2% are Christians. Half, more three quarters are nominal, even more than three quarters. We're going to wake up. Ralph Winter talks about the four categories of evangelism and missions. The first category is yes, zero, reaching nominal people in church. That's also part of missions. So the message of the Great Commission is repentance and forgiveness of sins. He says, even though your, your sin is red like scarlet, it will, that's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing for, for forgiveness. Of sins. I have so many testimonies. People who are horrible, God forgive them. We are all horrible. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. I was a horrible sinner. God saved me. How gloriously. Hallelujah. And to see people come to Christ is the greatest miracle. That joy. That joy. Number four is the model of the Great Commission, John 20 21. As the Father has sent me, so do I send you. You, as I point to you, three fingers are pointing to me. So, you, you are sent. I started by saying, if you forget everything, don't forget this one. I will never forget because it's a paradigm shift. In our missions conference last month, get my first, a professor of missiology from Trinity Theological Seminary, he, he was a speaker and, and we were so blessed by that statement he made because there's that uh, kind of tension between the church and parachurch and mission agency and who is to send and say the mission agency doesn't have the right to send the church has to send and we all agree the church is saying we'll go and that's right we're all part of the church there should be no division no dichotomy we are part of the church but he dropped a bomb shell he said the church is not the sender oh Everybody was quiet. What do you mean the church is not a sender? He said, the church is not a sender. The church is the saint. God is the sender. <laughs> he put into, into rest hundreds of years of argument. And I came on it. He says, you are not the sender. You are the saint. We are all the parachurch, the mission agency, the church, the Bible institutions, the missionary trainees. Every, we are the saint. Once you are born again, you are part of the church and the army of God. You are a saint. Jesus says, as the Father has sent me, so do I send you. So today I have good news for you. You are sent. Whether you're a lawyer, a doctor, you're an electrician, you're a mason, you're a student, you're doing your master's, whether you are what, an accountant, an engineer, <laughs> whatever you are, whatever profession, you are sent. Whether you're a policeman, you're a lecturer, you are sent. Whether you're a politician, you are sent. You are sent. You are sent. If you forget anything, don't forget you are sent. It's a paradigm shift. It will change the church. Everybody is sent. All hands on deck. We have our marching orders. Forward march. All hands on deck. Like Israel, everybody has to do military training. You cannot go. All hands on deck. Everybody is sent. That's the model of the Great Commission. It's not for a few people. We made it for a few people, the missionaries. Well, your baby sucks there, one percent, only one percent, and the ninety-nine percent is just playing church. And when the one percent is called, the ninety-nine percent will even persecute the church, will persecute them. I have a message for parents: Let my children go. I'm going to preach that message. I've been going to churches. And, let my children go. That's a message from the Lord for parents. If you're a parent, you're watching. Let your children go. You have five children, and one is a doctor, one is a lawyer, and one is an engineer. And the last one says, I feel called to mission. He said, no ways. You also have to be an engineer. You have to work in a bank. What is wrong with you? Do you know this God you are talking about? My mother was the president of the Women's Fellowship in the Presbyterian Church. She was the chairperson of the education board at the church. But when I got called, at the age of 10, my mother said, no, send her pardon, but why it will not come on. It will not come on. Isabel Kung said her mother was the chairman or the chairperson of the missionary 
society in their church. Isabel Kuhn wrote a book and God called her as a missionary and she went to her mother because her mother is saying to people, go, go, go. And then God called her and then she was thought, wow, her mother was so excited. She went to her mother and said, mama, I feel the call of God to go to her mother said, it will not come on. You are not called. You cannot go. He said, but mama, you are the chairperson. You have been telling people to go. God is serious. We are not serious. It's when the rubber hits the road that you realize that people are not serious. Reverend Jeff tells the story of a young man at Legon Campus, University of Ghana. And whenever he proposes to a sister and says, I'm called to missions, the sisters will bounce in. They'll say, oh no. So one day he comes to me and says, I have a beloved, I have a fiancé. He said, did you tell her you are going to be a missionary? I said, no. <laughs> no ways. If I tell her I'm going to be a missionary, she's going to say no. <laughs> He's going to say no. One of our young men, he's in the upper west region in the very bushy area, rich and rich people group. And an, a Christian met him there. A man who is in the chair met him and said, why are you wasting your life? Why are you wasting your time? Whose daughter do you think will marry you and come and stay in the village? And the man is in the church. I said, there are people who marry them. I know some of them. I know Kate Azuma. I know Eleonora uh, Johnson. I know Adoba. I know people who marry those people. My wife married me. I told her, I'm going to be a missionary. That's how I proposed. I pray God will raise missionary wives and raise missionary husbands and God will raise a multitude, a, a generation who are ready to go anywhere. It's Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and then Israel. God decides. That's the last one. The power of the Great Commission. That's one day. So you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Then with my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost part of it. Whether it's marketplace, whether you go to Timbuktu, it's God who decides. I didn't call myself to go to foreign missions. It's God who called me. I could never do anything about it. I was minding my own business. If you knew me, you'd be surprised. God calls. He is the great commissioner. He's still calling people. And he decides whether you do urban missions, Greek, Jerusalem, or Judea, Samaria. God will call people. If nobody does the ends of the earth, even as we are mobilizing the marketplace, I am for the marketplace, everybody, all hands on deck, whether a lawyer, doctor, accountant, teacher, nurse, everybody should be bad. We are all making disciples. Say, as you go, make disciples. God is serious about this thing. As you go, I can share millions of testimonies with you. As you go, as you go to work, as you go to the mall, as you go to the market, as you go home, as you board the Uber, as you board the Trotsky, as you board the Okat, wherever there are sinners everywhere. As you sit in the train, as you sit in the plane, everywhere you go, it's not empty, but everywhere you go, there are souls that we should be passionate. I pray for a staring up in my heart, in your heart. The power of the Great Commission is the Holy Spirit. And God will decide where. Because there are people who have to go to this 7,400 people. Groups. Some people have to go. People sacrifice. A woman's son, her son came from, from England and, 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 and died. And the other son, he had two sons. She had two sons. And the first one came and died. They used to call West Africa the white man's grave. And the second one went to the mother and said, Mama, I feel called to West Africa. And she, he was trembling because he has lost their brother, their woman has two sons, and one has come and died, and the second one is also going. And the mother said, go, and the Lord be with you. And if you die, I'll see you in heaven. I pray for such mothers. I pray for such young men and young women who will lay down their life, who are ready to go anywhere, wherever, wherever God sends you. It might be to a prestigious university like uh, Lauren Kahneman said. It might be to your next door neighbor. It might be to your legal office. It might be anywhere else. But God is still sending. He's still in the sending business. He has not stopped. He is so serious. If I tell you some of the things God will do, somebody said God closed the factory for him because he was not responding. <laughs> God will do anything to move because the harvest is plenty, but the workers are few. God is serious. That's his heartbeat every second. The great and the great commission is because of the skill and the scope. Luke 15 verse 10 says, In the same way I tell you there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. That's what makes heaven rejoice. 
When you graduate with an MBA, it's a good thing. We will rejoice. When you finish your PhD, we will rejoice. I like, I like graduations as a graduation Saturday. When you are getting married, I'll come to your wedding. I love weddings. You will come. When, when, when you buy a new car, we'll praise God. But those things don't make heaven excited. It makes earth excited. The things that excite us doesn't excite heaven. They get excited. There's a part in heaven when one soul gets saved. May, may earth begin to align with heaven. Proverbs 11, 30 says, The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life. A he who wins souls is wise. And Romans 1, 6, Paul says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel. I am not ashamed. Believers today are ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. A man called Ron Luz who started Team Mania. Timania is like EY with young people ministry, teenagers and young people in universities. Uh, he had acquired a fire conferences and went around mobilizing young people. When we were in Botswana, he would send thousands of people every year on short term missions. They used to say, you know, America sends like two million young people going around the world. And his ministry was sending a lot of people. And he said, the Great Commission is a great adventure of Christianity. The Great Commission is a great adventure of Christianity. <laughs> when you are not involved in a Great Commission, you have no adventure. You are just playing church. You are just playing around. It's like you are at the beach, but you are playing. You can't go into the sea. You say, those who do business with God in deep water, they shall see the mighty works of God. The Great Commission is a, You know, the church has made a Great Commission a, a, a backyard thing. When the church is starting, that's the main activity. The church is excited. After the church grows, then the Great Commission is put on the back door. Nobody is interested again. But the Great Commission is the great adventure of Christianity. My friend from Malawi, Rubin Chakala, said, for the Great Commission to happen, there will be a need for a great mobilization. There's a need for a great mobilization. I pray 100%. Great adventure. It's supposed to be exciting. When they say missions, you know, one time I remember Sister Kate, Kate Azuma, and myself, and I, I don't know who else, some of the young people who went to a church near Kate's area, and, and it was an online meeting, and they gave us one hour. They gave me one hour to speak. And after I finished speaking, the pastor was so excited. He came thanking me and said, I'm so happy you came because we did, if we didn't put you in the all night, they would like the all night. But if we say it's a missions program, they will not come. Nobody will attend. So we have to put you in the all night. I'm happy that you sacrificed to come. And so the pastor said, you know, I, I don't know about our young people. If we say we are going to the beach, they say, yeah. If we say we are going to a picnic, they say, yeah. If we say we are going to have a pizza party, they say, yeah. If we say if we are going on evangelism, then they say, oh. If we are going on missions, oh, they drop their head. Nobody will come. But the Great Commission is a great adventure of Christianity. That's what's supposed to excite us more than anything else. It's supposed to say, yes! Yes! We're going to catch fish. We're going to catch men. Drag them out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. It's the greatest thing anybody can do. I don't know how the devil managed to convince people that when you do ministry, you are wasting your life, wasting your time. A fine young man like Atuakwa, and they'll say he's wasting his time. No, I can't understand. I can't understand. I was 25 years old when I was called. I'm 51. I've been in ministry 26 years. Next year, next month, I'll be 27 years. I'm not looking back. I get excited every day. They say, oh, we give you a few years. You'll be tired and you go. My friend say, if you get your job in London, we pay you 100000 a year. Will you go? I say, what job? I already have the best job in the world. I have the biggest employer. I have the master himself as my, my boss. What job? I am already fully employed. Going to be a sight of the Great Commission. And when somebody is called, you're going to rally around you and say, Ah, too, we're going to support you. That's what they do in America. Everybody's going to say, We're going to support you. We're going to, if the person is working at the bank, they are paying 8,000. The missionary, also, people, his friends will also support him the same amount. That's what they do. And I pray that Africa will arise. The whole world is looking to Africa. I have so many slides, but there will be no time for it. But let me say to you, the whole world is looking at Africa. And the question I ask is Africa ready you know two years ago you should have heard this many times but if you have not heard it before i want you to know two years ago africa became the continent with the highest number of christians 631 million from the dark continent to the light continent hallelujah 
30 million more than Latin America. And the Center for Mission Mobilization says if even 1%, 0, not even 1%, 0.1% .1 of Anglophone Africa, English speaking Africa, not even including the Francophone and Lusophone, the Portuguese and the French speaking Africa, it will be 177,000 workers. That would be the greatest harvest force. And everywhere I go around there, what people say is Africa's time. Everybody's like, you are now, it's your, it's your time. But I don't see it. I used to be excited. Oh, with that, they used to look down there. And one day I had to speak at Moody Bible College in, in Chicago. And then I called, I said, who is from Australia? Come. Who is from Latin America? Come. Who is from Europe? Come. Somebody from North America? Come. And I called young men on the stage. And I held their hands. I said, the Great Commission is not a baton. <laughs> and I held their hands and we walked around. And they clapped and clapped and rejoiced. But I said to them, the Great Commission is not something you do and then you pass it on the baton. No! It's everybody, all hands on deck. Young, old, rich, poor, everybody, nobody is exempted. Because God is serious about this business. Everything else we do, he said, the Great Commission is not an option to be considered. It is a command to be obeyed. Halston Taylor. The only alternative to soul winning is so disobedience to God. That's what Curtis Halston said. This generation of Christians is responsible for this generation of souls on earth. You remember Kid Green? I wish I could go into the reasons why Christians are not involved. One is fear. Two is ignorance. Another one is a sense of inadequacy. Worldly lifestyles, complacency, no sense of mission and purpose. Many Christians don't realize that we have a mission from God. Selfishness and self-centeredness. And, and the list goes on. No theology of sacrifice. It's me, myself, and I. Nobody's ready to sacrifice for Jesus, but he suffered for us. No emphasis in the churches today. Churches don't emphasize the agency of the Great Commission and the world and world missions. And, and the list goes on. Many don't believe that Jesus is the only way to heaven. Where I'm, I preach the gospel to young people and many will tell me, oh, they are, some are agnostics. When I'm driving, I, I give young people a lift and I'm preaching, some are agnostics. I told our team, everybody go preach the gospel. I, I was preaching, I went to a, a, a supermarket and a manager's young lady from a certain West African country. I was preaching to her, she said, uh, she's in between, uh, she, she wants to choose, she's given herself five years to choose between Christianity, Islam and Judaism. And these are young people and, and so much confusion. And many Christians don't literally believe in a literal hell and that a loving God will send people of other faiths to hell fire. But this is real. I have 12 reasons by Dr. Quillet why we have to take the Great Commission serious. I don't think time will allow. There are 12 reasons. Everybody is supposed to be involved. Every single person. Evangelist, that's the Greek word for evangelism in the New Testament. It's used 52 times. It's so important to announce and proclaim the good news. And it can be in your Jerusalem, it can be Judea, Samaria, on the ends of the earth. Ghana has 19 unreached people groups. Africa has 988 unreached people groups. And there are 116 unengaged. And you understand and the Joshua Project people ask, why are there unrich people groups? Why? Where are they in the 1040 window? Five out of six unrich people groups are in the 1040 window. Starting right from West Africa. Right from the tip of Ghana, Nigeria, you know, Northern Ghana goes. That's why we are part of the Go North Initiative. Out of the whole of Northern Africa and the Middle East are there. And God is calling young people. God is calling young people. Some of you, instead of going to study some other countries, you can choose to go study in Morocco. Do your master's, do your PhD in Morocco, in Tunisia. We have friends there. We can't see everything on camera. This is online, so we can't see everything. But if you hear God calling you, don't say no. We need to be creative. The Chinese are creative. You know, the Chinese said they are sending 100,000 young people around the world. They have what they call the great, uh, Back to Jerusalem movement. They say the gospel went from Jerusalem around the world and they are taking the gospel from China back to Jerusalem. 
and Nigerians said 50,000. You know, in Ghana, many times I speak at universities and people say, what about Ghana? And then fortunately, last year, last year's Ghana, we came out with a vision 2040 to send 30,000. I don't know which country you are, but I pray your country will also have a vision to send missionaries. And that includes you. <laughs> We're going to send young men and young women. I have gone for nine years. I have not stopped going. And if God calls me to take my wife and children, we'll go. We have not settled. It's time. But right now, I'm, I'm a missionary in Accra. All the rich people groups in the northern part of Ghana, we are reaching up in north. They are also in Accra. They are in Medina. They are in Adenta. They are in Abubloshi. We, we cannot do urban missions. If we do urban missions, we can reach them. They are even more open. Do you know that I, I found out last month that there are 800,000 documented Chinese in Ghana. I was shocked. The Lebanese are here, the Turkish are here. You go to a Turkish restaurant, they, we're going to reach them. They come and they spread their faith, we're going to reach them. So the, 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 the goalposts are shifted. You know, now you can be in Accra, you can be in Nairobi, you can be in Kampala, you can be in, in, in Lusaka, and you can do global missions. <laughs> it's amazing. Because all the world is a cosmopolitan city, it's a cosmopolitan world, it's a global village, and the rich, but we don't take note, we are not intentional. And God is calling you. Your phone can be the missionary tool that you can reach. And the stories I hear about people from the Middle East and their eagerness and hunger for the gospel, I was amazed. And groups like Great Commission, I'm sure you always learn to have specific ministry online. <laughs> To reach people who are inquiring, who are hungry for the gospel. There are countries where they block the signals for television and satellite, but they can't block WhatsApp, they can't block the phone. It's amazing what God is doing. And with the coronavirus, everything's online. <laughs> and hundreds are coming to Christ. It will amaze you. He said, globally, 87% of Buddhists, Hindus, and Muslims have very limited, if any, contact with Christians. Let me run up. My time is up. Less than one in ten missionaries work among the rich people groups. And as we talk now, many worshippers are still missing. Remember? Revelation 5, 9. God wants people from every tribe. He died and we You know, let me end. As God is serious about the Great Commission, the church is not serious. The Banner Group in America, they did a survey. And 76% of U.S. churchgoers either have not heard of the Great Commission or do not know what it means. It's an as one eight interpreted as then theology rather than end. It's not a then, but it's end. Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and the ends of the earth. 76% of America, you know, America is a country that sends more missionaries than any other country in the world today. 76 don't know. Only 51% say we've never heard before, and the rest we don't. We've heard, but we're not sure. I was teaching a certain campus, I'll mention the name of the university. A Christian university here in Ghana. So I took the students out and said, let's do a survey. Because this is American statistics. We normally don't do so much research in Africa. Let's take a small sample size of 100. A sample size of 100. And ask them the same question. Have you heard of the Great Commission? We came back 58 out of 100. 58% had not heard. And I said, wow. Brothers and sisters, we have a problem. Why are we not taking this serious? <laughs> But today I want to remind you, God takes it serious. I can go scripture after scripture. He said only 2% of believers regularly share their faith. And every year, 36.4 million people die without Christ. In conclusion, my brothers and sisters, in conclusion, this is what you can do. Pray. Pray that God will give you a burden for the lost. Pray that God will give you a burden for the nations. When you watch the news, there's something stirring up in your heart. Pray. I used to think of Northern Nigeria. I used to watch the news and there's war. And I thought God would send me to Northern Nigeria. But God sent me to Southern Africa. Pray. Let God stay something. Be bold and resist the fear, the spirit of fear and timidity and share the gospel. Take advantage of the open doors the Lord brings your way to share the gospel, both home and overseas. Both home and overseas. Build relationships and create opportunities with the people, the Turkish the Chinese, the Lebanese, the Indians, make disciples who make disciples who make disciples. Disciple making, we have not gone to the north for about seven months because of coronavirus. When we went, the disciple making movement is going on because the disciples are making disciples who are making disciples. It's not about me, it's about Jesus Christ. Number eight, pray passionately for unbelievers to be saved. We cannot pray, we have to have a heart to pray. Live a holy, number nine, live a holy, godly, Christ-like life Number 10, be spirit-led and leave the results to God. 
I have three more number 11. Research more about the rich and the nations and keep yourself missionary hot. That's what I say. Read missionary magazines like the Voice of Mission in Ghana. We came out with Ghana Mission Center. There are many machine magazines. You can go online. There's so much online. Read those things and keep your fire burning. Then number 12, there are operation. There's operation world help. There's prayer cast. You can pray for the rich every day, even from your phone. And number 13, support missionaries. Generously. Give a big budget. Give. When I look at your checkbook, I look at your finances, I can tell that whether you are serious about your great commission or not. John Wesley said there are many conversions. Some, they are not converted from their pocket. So in conclusion, my brothers, the called ones are the sent ones. The 99% must be mobilized to join the 1% harvest force. The marketplace ministry is needed, all hands on deck. Now is the time, and God has raised Africa for such a time like this. And I want to say to you, yes, God is serious, literally serious about reaching every single person in the world. And say so this gospel shall be preached to all nations, then the end will come. Stand strong. Don't let your love grow cold. And be part of the hand timer.